Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History. Uh, I'm just getting over our tail end of a cold here, so if I sound funny, that's why. I got the water and the mouth lozenges and everything ready to go. Uh, so other than that, today we are doing a, a, a topic with a, a great historian and author who's agreed to come on about an area I know next to nothing about, uh, which is great because I get to learn alongside everybody else. So we're going to be talking about, and it sounds still weird to say out loud, a Canadian regiment and the Continental Army during the American Revolution, War of Independence, whatever you want to call it. I've known about this unit for a bit, don't know many details. So thanks to Scott, who was at uh, Mount Vernon, I'm not sure how long ago now, I saw this book and asked me if I could reach out to today's guest, Holly Mayer, about talking about this book. So I reached out to Holly and she agreed to come on. So we've been uh, just emailing back and forth, but we're going to keep it uh, pretty freewheeling and informal as we love to do here. And if you have questions, fire away and we will answer them in time. Uh, but other than that, welcome Holly today. Holly, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. And you can hey thank you for inviting me. Oh no, it's my pleasure to have you on. I'm I'm always trying to cover new areas, and this is definitely one I want to do more with in the future. So thanks for, for being the first, I don't know, American Revolution War of Independence person. I don't always call it, but uh excited to kind of dig into this area a little bit. So as I always you know ask people, and as I told you, um Ask why. Why this topic in particular? I'd love to hear how you got into this one. I really backed into it is that the research project as I had begun it was going to be an exercise in the creation of American identity through military service okay. and during the American Revolution. Because there's always this question is when did these colonists... Mm -hmm start thinking of themselves as Americans. What did being American mean? And there's always been stuff about it before going to war where they right. say, oh, they had this new identity. So off we go and we fight to have our independence. Right. And others like Joyce Appleby are arguing the first true Americans are after the war. They're born after it and they're born into the United States of America okay. as Americans. And my contention has often been that no, many of them developed this identity through military service by being in the Continental Army, okay. by meeting with others from these various colonies, now states from different regions, from marching through them, from hearing the rhetoric of revolution, of sharing experiences, you know, coming back to these ideas that we see in so many other wars, the idea of brotherhood, right. shared experiences, what that means for developing a sense of community and identity. And I thought, I think that that's really important for these revolutionaries yeah. is when you think about how many served at various different times from the groups that they're, they're meeting it, they're learning about this country and this nation at the same time. So I started doing the research and my first approach was to try to find journals and orderly books and others where people are recording what they're hearing, what they're doing, what they're thinking. Well, unfortunately, as you probably all know, as you're doing the research, there's not a lot of reflective soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> um, and, and they're certainly not writing these things. If they're keeping a journal often, it's like, we marched this many miles and we went through this kind of weather. And, and I'm here going, well, why aren't you saying, well, we heard this speech and we thought it was wonderful and I feel good about being an American. And I'm going, okay. Yeah. But in one of those journals, it was from Sergeant Major John H. Hawkins from Moses Hazen's regiment. Uh -huh. And it's a it's a wonderful journal. It's at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I thought, oh, great, this guy really does write well. He does have a few reflections, not enough. <laughs> but, um, you know, I thought, okay, let me learn more about him. And he was in this regiment. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, you know, I've been studying the revolution a lot and this war, and I'm going, what's this Canadian regiment? <laughs> like so many others that I've seen since and I've heard from since, everybody's going, what the heck? Yeah. There were Canadians in this on the American side? And, and so I started digging because one of my thoughts was, um, hey, let me edit and annotate his journal and get that out there because here's wow. this great primary source 
that should be more readily accessible. But to do that, I needed to do the research so I can do the annotations. Gotcha. Well, in the end, I didn't annotate the uh, journal. Instead, right. I wrote the book about what I was finding as I was getting it. So he dug me. It was like the sergeant major introduced me to this totally different regiment. And I thought, you know, if I don't know much, and it seems like it's a rather important regiment, right. maybe more needs to be out there about yeah. them. So I went down that rabbit hole of doing it. And as I said, what I found is that there were two regiments that were called, you know, the first Canadian regiment with James Livingston, which he started to put, James Livingston started to put that together in the fall of 1775 when the invasion was on. Yeah. Whereas Moses Hazen was still debating whether or not he was going to go with the Americans or with the Brits. Right. Because he, he served with very, the British Army, right? Yes. Right. You know, he was American born in Massachusetts. But during the Seven Years' War, he had served first with the Massachusetts militia, then with Rogers Rangers, and then he got a British Army commission. And he had settled up there in the Champlain Valley, and you know, near St. John's and, and just became more of a Canadian. So it was like, which way is he going to go? Mm. And then ultimately by January, especially after the British didn't think he was all that somebody to be really, <laughs> mm. you know, yeah. is he somebody we can trust in all of this? Yeah. He ended up creating his own regiment in January. So Congress is who did this, not one of the states. Congress authorized these two regiments, they authorized James Livingston to create the first Canadian. In other words, recognizing that he had been there on the ground already supporting the invasion first. Right. And then Moses Hazen, they said, you have the go ahead to do the second Canadian. Now, understand when Congress did this, and this is what's a little unusual. Most of the other regiments had started with state permission or colony right. permission. Here is Congress making the decision. But their idea was that the Canadians, the Quebecois, they would see that we're the way to go, you know, join the Americans because Congress was going up going, you want to join with us. The British are your enemies. You know, yeah, you were accorded all this stuff in the Quebec Act, yeah. you know, got this, but we're going to guarantee your religious rights. We will get you in for more representative government. We'll get you in for all this other stuff. Join us. And uh, as a result, they had hoped that by authorizing these two Canadian regiments, it would have been a further inducement mm -hmm. to join the American rebellion. And then, then it would have been up to the Canadians and the Canadian provinces to support these regiments like the states were supporting the state regiments. Okay, I see. It never happened. No. <laughs> None of that what did. I get is the, the Canadians and Quebecois, there were a number of people who were very interested in this. Okay. And if the Americans had done better with their invasion, if they mm. had not lost at the Battle of Quebec, yeah. um, there was a chance there would have been more. But that's one of those what if histories. Right. But anyway, <laughs> that's where I got into it. And I go, but then it didn't totally dissolve. These right. the remainders, not everybody, but these Canadians then followed the American army on the retreat. Yep. Uh, and then they were on those bateaus. They went down Lake Champlain. They ended up at Crown Point and then Ticonderoga, yep. at which point there was that question, should they be reconstituted? And by September of 1776, the Congress said, yes, you can reconstitute these regiments and you can recruit from any of the states, right. as well as, of course, still recruiting Canadians if they are refugees and the like that were still coming down. So right. that's how I got into it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely backing into a project, I think, yeah. in a almost literal sense, finding a source and then go in that direction. I mean, that happens frequently, but it, it's always good to hear. Yeah. And so that that's happens. why I was intrigued by it is because I was going, if Canadians joined, those who joined, did they become Americans? 
Yeah. You know, exactly. How do they feel about this? How do all of those from the other states feel about serving with Canadians? So I was still into American identity, but I am finding these people from different areas coming together. And I was going, this is an intriguing study to see how this would actually work. And thus, I just started to research deeper and deeper into the regiment. Yeah. And uh, just again, plug the book because I'm going to. <laughs> uh, it's linked down below for anybody who wants to uh, to purchase it through uh, Amazon. And it will help the channel. So thank you. Because um, I want to give everything away. That's why I said that. <laughs> because uh, then people won't read the book. But um, I had a I had a question, and James is asking a question, one of our viewers, um, about joining the Retreating Americans. So I, I want to expand this a little bit to frame this differently because you said you backed in this project because of a primary source. Right. Was there, were you able to get any primary sources from those who were Canadian, quote unquote, who joined the regiment? Were you able to find anything in that regard? Not as much. Um, I did go up to Ottawa and do a little bit of research there. <laughs> and so most of the stuff I found in Ottawa was more related to Moses Hazen. Right. So, and again, you know, Hazen had become a senior after the, the, the Seven Years' War, he had acquired land. Um, he certainly had habitants on his lands, and he was promoting and actually recruiting among some of them who joined oh, okay. wow. into this okay. regiment. And then, so it was him, it was Lieutenant Colonel Edward Antell, his second, was, again, another one of those. It, Edward Antill had been born in New Jersey. He had been educated at King's College, what became Columbia in New York City. And he too, at the end of the seven years, had migrated up okay. to Montreal, Quebec, um, setting himself up as a lawyer, a barrister. You know, he was uh, partly merchant, you know, so they had, so these were these Anglo, you know, these Americans who had moved up to become these these early Anglo-Canadians, if you will, in that period. Because I think that's the other part to look at Canada is how many people from the lower colonies started to move up there as going, right. this is prime opportunity here. We can set ourselves up. So I was finding stuff for Edward Antill um, because of his uh, official duties, Moses Hazen, for some of the soldiers, the Canadian soldiers, where I was getting some of their accounts more likely was for the Gosselins. The Gosselins were definitely rebels against British command okay. in there. And they were seen as bad guys. The British command was looking for these guys, you know. Okay. And so you see some accounts about what they were. Um, you look for some of the others that I found in the pension accounts. In other words, right. if they live long enough for the pension accounts or what it really was is if their widows lived long enough for widow accounts, I was getting part right. of their stories through those kind of accounts is to tr just deal with that. Um, some of their bounty lands. So, so many of the Canadians who stayed with these regiments ended up getting bounty lands and settling right there up on the New York Canadian border. <laughs> so many of them came right from that, that Richelieu Valley area, yep. just South of Montreal. Yep. And they ended up coming up Lake Champlain and being smack dab often between like 30 or 50 miles of where they had started the war. It's just that they were across the border now where they were getting their lands and they were getting their pensions. So that's where I was finding some more of those kind of accounts about those soldiers. So yes, as is typical in many things, you get more on the officers than you do. Yeah, that's regular soldiers. Unfortunately, that has not changed. Um, yeah, at all. it's still the same um, with my primary work. Like I said, in the 20th century. But yeah, th I mean that's fascinating. Going all that way, literally, because mm -hmm. I was looking at their their um, the battles they fought in, which are quite all over the place. End up at Yorktown. Yep. All the way down to Virginia, you know. All like, Virginia, okay. And then all the way back to be within what a couple of what a half an hour's drive of today's time. Of yeah, basically, yes, yeah. right up to the border. You could go back and forth, not a problem. Yeah. It's 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 absolutely wild that uh, that happened. Because I was doing again, like I said, some quick reading and it sounded like they had some issue with getting land grants, and then eventually it did happen. Yeah, um, so there was that, but yeah. Yeah. Um the question would have been where. And okay, what Congress right. did was yep. asked New York State 
whether New York State would then basically say, we will take the Canadian refugees and make them New York State citizens, and right. thus we will use New York lands for them. Right. Because Moses Hazen at the end of the war was also fighting very hard to, if they couldn't get lands up there, to get it in the Ohio Territory where there was right. other federal grants for right. the pensioners. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, this is a good question, kind of going off that as well. But did they stay? Because again, this is another big question that's very murky, and we've tried to talk about it on the channel before and not really come to any conclusions. But the idea of British subjects and identity. But do you know anything about how these soldiers would have been treated if they did try to go back to what yeah. became Canada? Well, this is this is a big issue. So when they made the decision to join Hazen's regiment or to indeed fight for these invaders in the case, um, obviously they were going to be in trouble in some form. So Moses Hazen, Edward Antill, the officers knew they could not go back, that right. their lands, their properties were going to be forfeit, um, that they wouldn't. The question would have been, what about the common soldiers? Yeah. So, you know, the governor general is saying, no, you can come back. We, okay. we will understand that. And some did. Okay. So when, yeah. yeah, after after the Battle of Quebec, the American army hunkered down around Quebec for a while and then died of smallpox and various other things in there. Yeah. And so many of the Canadians made the decision in that case to stay. It didn't look like the Americans would necessarily win this conflict. Do we right. really want to lose it? So some of the officers know it's not going to happen. You're going to lose no matter which way you go. You might as well follow along. Others followed. Um, one of the, now he was an officer, Antoine Paulint. He knew that his property probably would be forfeit in the case. The other thing with Antoine Paulint that was interesting and a few of the others is they had actually served with the French during the Seven Years' War and yeah. then ended up staying in Canada um, not too happy about the British as their overlords. So in this case, it's almost like the enemy of my enemy is indeed my friend. Right. I will join with these. And so they continued with them that way. So um, so some stayed. When we look at it, for instance, Moses Hazen, at the point of retreat, probably had about 250 in his regiment. So it was very okay. small. He was authorized to have 1,000, but he only had oh, about okay. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And most of them, you know, started leaving so that by the time the regiment was to be reconstituted, August, September, whatever, he probably only had about 100 wow. okay. left at that point. So many had indeed said, no, we're going to stay in Canada. And they could. Um, I will okay. say that it wasn't like there was going to be this really massive retaliation on them. The officers, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Didn't okay. have a choice, but your common soldier. Now, the other part of this that does happen, though, um, that we don't see enough, and I haven't done enough research on it, is that some Canadians continued to be refugees over yeah. time, and they would wander down, and they generally settled around Albany, New York, during the course of the war. So, And that's where a lot of the soldiers and officers from Hazen's regiment parked their women and children is for part of the war, is to put them there as they go into action. Right. So there is that movement still back and forth across the border. Yes. And it continues to build. Um, Canadians are going in. They're not enough who are joining the American forces to build the regiment to its thousand man um, allocation. So instead they recruited elsewhere in the colony or in the States at that point. Yeah. Um, to build up the numbers. The only other thing I can tell you is that after the war ended, some of the Canadians who had served in these regiments went back north of the border and settled back in Canada. They went back to their homes along the Richelieu Valley, stayed there. And then why they end up coming back, and I get them in the pension accounts, is that they come back to get those pensions. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because to get them, you had to go in and you wrote it and you said, and I am now residing in. Yes. And they had to be south of the border. So some went north and then came back and others just stayed north. Yeah. I mean, that's not uncommon. <laughs> yeah. That happens later as well. Uh, even with the American Civil War, it's uh, similar stories. Um, 
a question just popped in my head. Uh, and again, you don't have to have like the exact answer, but is there a rough split between, because again, identity is so tricky at this time period. <laughs> what becomes Quebec was so the Canadian or the French speaking people, were there, was it majority them? Was it Anglo Canadians? Was it, was there any split? Was there any notice of any of this difference? There, what you might expect this is that the Canadians who were officers were generally Anglo. <laughs> that makes perfect sense, yeah. You know, not every single one, like Antoine Pauline, well, he had created an independent company that ended okay. up being attached to Moses Hazen's regiment and ultimately brought in with it. But it's interesting, there he is as an officer, right? but it's more with that kind of independent company at first. So Hazen okay. was Anglo, Edward Antill was Anglo, Many of the other officers, you know, were coming in more Anglo that had settled. And then it was most of the soldiers who were indeed Francophone that okay. in that way. So there is a split, if you will, in ranks that way. Yeah, that um, makes perfect sense, given the time period. Yeah. Um, did that cause a lot of trouble <laughs> within the regiment? Well, the thing was, is if you looked at it, like Hazen and Edward Antill, they had learned French, you know, to do their business in Canada, yeah. they had gotten it. Many of those who did, what was, what you did see in the regiment is they created the Francophone companies and then the Anglophone companies. Mm. I had hoped to see more integration especially as they started to recruit from other areas. And I thought, wouldn't that be very interesting to see how the army is a scene of integration from right. different okay. places? Yep. Is how do you, I call it continental. I said the first step to becoming American was to become continental. Okay, perfect. You know, and then yeah. you move to becoming an American identity. So being okay. continental meant you're Canadian continentals, you're, you know, right. Virginia continentals, you're Pennsylvania. Con and then from there you become Americans and you certainly see that aspect. Um, the, the French tended to stay pretty much within their own companies. The right. one plus that was interesting in there is there were one or two officers that came in from Maryland and they brought some Maryland troops and they tended to have some French. But the other part that was interesting is that included some Catholics. So the right, Maryland. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that helped there because you've got a regiment now that's got a solid core of Catholics, the Francophone Catholics. Yeah. And then we add in some of the Maryland Catholics. And so there's another cultural component to this this regiment there okay this is just getting me more confused <laughs> oh sorry yeah no that's good that's what we like here um i did not expect that because that was gonna be my next question because it's in the parts of the book and i've i've heard about this other places uh, that there's other again this time period i keep using modern terms because i don't know what else to use but there's other nationalities included in this unit can you yeah. tell us uh, some of those <laughs> no it's it's tremendous. So by region, it's very diverse. Uh, we've got people from Canada all the way down through North Carolina is joining this regiment. So yeah. it's one of the reasons why I like to say this regiment in some ways is a microcosm of the Continental Army is that it's got people from all of these different areas. And when it started as a regiment, they generally came into companies that reflected their regional because the, these captains okay. would go and recruit from their particular regions and bring these people in. Over right. the course of the war, as uh, some of these captains either died or they they retired, you know, they left and yeah. others came in, they did start to integrate them from different regions. Right. Except for in some cases the Francophones, <laughs> that right. they tended to stay in their regiments. But we did have this diverse. But on top of this. Mm -hmm. which makes it really interesting. And it's almost like a foreign legion in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> is that, that Moses Hazen's regiment at various times had been on guard duty with prisoners of war and they recruited among them, even when okay. they were exposed to sometimes, especially after Yorktown, they were in Moses Hazen's regiment, the, the second Canadian in charge at around Carlisle, York, Pennsylvania, and the like, where a lot of these prisoners went. Okay. And what that meant is they recruited Germans. 
Yeah, they okay. Included, as well as the British prisoners of war. So, and indeed, when you look at the records, there's a lot of German names that are added to this regiment by that time. Yeah. But you start putting it back and then you look at desertion notice and you see this is an Irish lad or, you know, a Scots yeah. lad or they're speaking French or they're... So the multi-ethnicity is a lot of it European. We've got it coming across the Atlantic that way from the various different uh, regions in the colonies. And the final part was, is there were a few African-Americans. Right. They're very difficult to find because the roster didn't necessarily point them out. Okay. okay. Uh, by color, they tended to do it by what state they're coming from because they want to get state aid to pay for these guys. Yeah. Where I found them was as I was going through records and we tend to do this by naming practices, saying this is a possible African name or a name that mm. was used for enslaved people. Is right. this indeed a person of color? And what I found a few that way in okay. later accounts, whether right. it was by um, by our annual, the, you know, the, the biannual census, you know, the 10 year census yeah. and they will note who they are yeah. by pension accounts, by other things. And we find them there. So I'm going, we had quite a few people represented from various different ethnicities. And again, I found that fascinating because I'm going, how did they all integrate? How did this actually work at this earlier period? Right. Yeah. And what I'm finding is that ultimately they do, that it's not so much the regional issue or color issue or ethnicity issue. There is a bit by language and by religion, but mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, it's working. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap all that around in my head because, yeah, that's that's not what you would necessarily nope. expect, I think, from a modern perspective because we tend to think, particularly in North America, by regional identity. Mm -hmm. it's groundbreaking to say that. So it's interesting to see that the, the, the religious aspect plays such a huge role because, again, I don't want to, it's hard to trans not transpose your own expectations and from other periods, right? Because my focus was Canadian. So you see that as well in Canada, right? It's yeah. sometimes it's, it's language, sometimes it's religion, sometimes it's both, <laughs> sometimes it's neither. Um, so it's it, it's very confusing, right? Because there, there's been mention of Irish Catholics being in, in Maryland and things like that, because that is a large group in Canada as well. Right. So it's just so interesting to hear that this has an even older precedent, just what becomes the other side of the border. Yeah, it was one of the pluses for doing this is you got, wow, how did they do it? Now, I will say that there were tensions in the regiment. Okay, cool. Um, and the tensions increased over time. Right. And part of those tensions were as a regiment that had been formed by Congress, not by a state. This was my next question. <laughs> yeah, is that how do you fund them? How do you supply yeah. them? Right. And Congress didn't have a lot of power to just pull all the money. So what it did is like so much in politics, not all the compromises work well, yeah. but what it did is it said to Hazen and the officers is record where each of these soldiers is coming from. You've got your numbers, you've got your names, and then you go to the various states to get them supplied. Okay. Which is, it didn't work real well for various regiments all the time. And now you've got a regiment going, I've got 20 soldiers yeah. from Virginia. Virginia, you need to give me this much money or this much supplies or this much support for those soldiers. New Jersey has this many. Pennsylvania has this many. Well, the other problem, as you might figure, is some states were better than others mm -hmm. in supplying their soldiers. Oh, yeah. This creates tension because you've got soldiers from one state or area or the Canadians who don't have any state. Yeah. Like, I'm not getting supplied like they are. Those guys are. That's okay. not fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Um, and then it got troublesome because Hazen is left in this going, what am I going to do? And at one point, Hazen decided he would take what's being sent in from all these states, keep it in a common pot, and okay. then just dole it out so it doesn't look like it's so inequitable. Right. But then you've got the ones coming from the states that are generous going, no, 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 we get <laughs> all of ours. 
you can just see them going, no, you can't hold that. That's mine, you know, from this. And so you get this and that starts to increase the tensions between the various soldiers and, you know, certain companies as who is getting what. And right. in between, Hazen keeps going back to Congress going, you've got to take care of my Canadians. <laughs> you know, his sense of these are my Canadians. Right. Um, and fighting like man going, they don't belong to a state. There are many other soldiers that don't belong to a yeah. state. Certainly those that had been recruited among you know, the prisoners of war don't belong to a state. How yeah. are you going to give me what I need to do? And it's true. At that point, Hazen was writing things like, you know, this is not how you're supposed to run an army. <laughs> I read that one of those letters, actually. Yeah. And it, it just, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not. It actually isn't. But but that created yeah. the tension so that by the end of the war, um, a regiment that had come together and looked like this great experiment about how do you integrate men from various different regions with cultural backgrounds starts to actually fall apart and yep. go, yep, yeah, they haven't quite found the solution yet by any means. Okay. Cause her question to ask, cause I was going to, well, I have two questions as a result of that. <laughs> um, cause again, it's not my area. Um, but logistically, that sounds like the biggest nightmare and headache of all time. That yeah. They literally, would they supply them, like, say, 10 guys coming from Virginia? Do they supply them in Virginia, then they join the regiment? Or is there Virginia ammo dump somewhere or something? Is that how that works? Or No, they would have come with certain supplies and things when they were actually recruited in Virginia. So okay. we see that they they had been recruited they're brought up. Um, they would stop in Philadelphia, by the way, for a smallpox inoculation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if they, you know, and finish that and they got through that, then they would join the regiment and continue. But from that point on, it was a matter of the state sending their requisition supplies and things more through Congress and through the commissariat, you know, the okay. commissary and quartermaster corps that would then have to be distributed to them these various soldiers and then down to the regiments themselves. But as I said, it just, it did not work very well at all. That, that's, that's wild. I mean, I can't not think about this, but it's just so funny if, imagine if that's how the U S ran the second world war and you'd be like, nothing would have ever happened. Well, and that's one of the things about this, this continental army, this it's an American army. It's a proto U S army, if you will. Yeah. is they're still trying to create an army or run an army based on confederation, not on a true federal yeah. or yeah. national system. And by giving everything out to the states, which they had to do by the Articles of Confederation, because most of the power is in the states, it's not in Congress. Yeah. And you're going... No, it's it's not a good way to do it. And you're right. You see it again in the Civil War when you look at the Confederate Army, which yeah, right. is an army of all kinds of different armies from these different regions. Yeah. And you've got the same kind of problems occurring. So one of the lessons that they learned from this, from Congress's own, from the army as a whole, is that an army has to be conducted at the national level. There are certain things that have to be done there. And then it comes back down to the army instead of scrambling to every one of the states every time you need supplies and more money and right. more men. Yeah. Well, that of course happens afterwards, right, as well. Why the yeah. Articles of Confederation are done away with because of various rebellions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that is just, wow. Okay, that's this is a silver wrap in my head around all this and how this was done. That is, that is absolutely wild. Um, so a question I had, it kind of going towards more to the end of, I don't know, the end of this unit, was there any sort of, other than the land grants in, say, upstate New York, um, mentions of this unit afterwards? Was there any, you know, connection, communication between soldiers, even officers? Was there any sort of that happening? Or was there any sort of formal learning being like this? We learned this because of this regiment. Did, did anything like that happen as well? I don't know if anybody made a formal uh, study, you know, an after action yeah. report about yeah. what we would do with this. And, yeah, yeah. I'm not so sure. But what was interesting is that when 
the war ended, as you go back in, by 1783, as we know, they're disbanding the American army. Yeah. And they furlough most of the soldiers by June and July of 1783. I, the, the, the formal peace treaty hasn't been fully signed. The ratification hasn't been there. But at that point, Congress and the states don't want to keep funding and supplying yeah. all these soldiers while they're sitting up in the Hudson Highlands waiting for this release. So they ended up furloughing them saying, you know, go home now, but if something fails, you're all supposed to report back. Yeah, yeah. that would be a good one to try. Yeah. But what was interesting, especially for Hazen's regiment and for the Canadian Continentals, is that many of them said, we don't have a place to go back to. Right. And we can't go anywhere unless we see more of our money at this point and we know where we can go. So right. there is a stopgap where most of them are staying there in the Hudson Highlands. They end up more around Fishkill in West Point, sitting there as they wait to see what's going to happen. And at that point, Congress did approve that they would be continued to be supplied for at least a short period of time, the way Congress would have been supplying refugees from Canada. So as I said before, there were Canadian refugees in the um, Albany area, and there had been this matter of trying to supply them. So, you know, we think about loyalists always as refugees yeah. going up into Canada. There were actually yeah. Canadians who were refugees who headed on down, and many of them ended up at Albany. And so there had been already a commissary established there Right. to, you know, sustain some of these refugees. So what they did is for these Canadian continentals is that you could go up there and you will still be sustained through the commissary. But this was only supposed to be short term. Now, mm -hmm. they had to expand it a little bit longer because it took New York a little bit longer to figure out where was going to be the refugee, the Canadian refugee lands. Right. And they finally established that, as I said, right up there. Um, near Plattsburgh. It was on Lake Champlain um, from the Plattsburgh area all the way up to the Canadian border. This became the Canadian refugee lands. And so there are some civilian refugees who get those lands. And of course, they allocate this then for the Canadian continentals as well, right. is to go through it. So what we had for the Canadian continentals is some are being sustained, at least through the commissary or from Albany for a while. Others are starting to help with Hazen's regiment, in particular, um, his nephew, Benjamin Moores, who was the adjutant of the regiment, already going up into that area and surveying. Okay. Even yeah. before they had permission, they would <laughs> survey these lands because uh, they were figuring that they would be theirs. And so some of the yeah. Canadians joined Moores on this to start doing right. this sort of thing. So they got that. They also received some money. All the soldiers were receiving some money because they hadn't been paid properly through most of the war. So yeah. they had received certificates that would pay back that, you know, they would get 80 bucks, you know, something like this to do it. So that was to sustain. Then they would get um, the bounty lands on top of that. But for most of the bounty lands, they had to wait like 10 years. You know, wow. there was this, this period of time, which is, again, that period where some of them just said, heck, I'm going back up home. Well, I was going to say, that was going to be my next, because the establishment of what be, is Upper Canada, which becomes Ontario, yeah. they're just giving land away like nobody's business. So for nothing. So why wouldn't you just jump back across when it's right there? Um, so, yeah, that's... Perfect sense. So we have a, a good question, actually. So you're mentioning those coming, you know, we know the loyalists, all that stuff coming down. Can you explain why that might happen? Because I just have a question, you know, what are they? Why are they all of a sudden needing to be refugees in, in upstate New York? What are they running? For? Yeah. Um, for some of them, they're family members. And okay. if the family member had joined the Continental Army, right. then they are no longer having that husband or father or brother to sustain them up in Canada. So they do end up coming back on down. Um, they run into trouble with British authorities up in Canada. So they come down right. looking for their opportunities with these particular regiments. So I think it's more family members. Um, okay. The other part is, yes, a few politicians and the like 
who had found it difficult to operate within the British system where they were more of, despite the Quebec Act, maybe second class citizens yep. but with not full representation and the like. So there were some, you know, again, when we look at borderlands, people are looking for opportunities. Where yep. does the better opportunity look like? Yep. And what's interesting is for some of those refugees, you can see that some of them have similar names or family names that you go and they apply for pensions down the line by 1820. And this becomes problematic because the board of war gets really, really focused going, there are way too many of these people applying that they belong to these regiments and they weren't right. actually on the rosters. Right. Um, but they were getting family members say, oh, yeah, 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 this was my cousin and he was in this and he served at this particular time. And they're going, no, it's not on the roster in here. And indeed, Benjamin Moores, um, as I said, he had been the adjutant. He had prepared a big roster of the regiment by 1782, mm -hmm. filled in. And by this time, by pension time, they kept coming back to him saying, can you vouch for this person as being a member of the regiment or not? And, and going back and forth, and he could do it. And by the way, I just want to point out, Benjamin Moores fought the, um, the Canadians again, or the British again, at the Battle of Plattsburgh. Um, so again, because they were in that area and they had been settled, I didn't find too many others from the first war that were up there. Benjamin yeah. Morris had been a lieutenant in the revolution and he was a general, a militia okay. general by the war of 1812. Yeah. I mean, it's, I know more about that one. So it's, it's, it's different than there's the whole issue with militias not wanting to cross borders. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do want to come back to that quickly, but this is a good question because I don't know. So, so Chaz asked, um, had the smallpox that was raging in other parts come to Canada? Because we know what happens at Quebec. Right. Because, do you know anything about that at all? If, if it you know, where parts? did it come from? Did it come up with the American forces? Was it here in Canada and they got it? I think it probably was a bit of both, is okay. that smallpox was endemic and it just burst right. through in various epidemics at times. Yeah. One of the problems with smallpox at that was that inoculation was available, yeah. but not everybody had really gone into it. And for the Americans at that point, the regulations were you did not get inoculated. The fear was if we had originally got them inoculated, if they weren't thoroughly properly quarantined, they would bring smallpox with them. Washington right. changed his mind. By the time we get into 77, it has been switched. And yeah. so right. it becomes policy then to inoculate, if you can at all get them separated enough, especially with new recruits, inoculate them before they get to the army. But you've got too many people going back and forth with these, dis you know, with these diseases. So the armies were incubators Yeah. as they move through. Well, yeah, that doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't yeah. really end with the First World War, right? And then that's the first major conflict that has more dying from combat than disease so than disease yeah yeah so that's uh yeah that makes perfect sense um okay so as we're moving towards the end here because this is a broader topic i want to talk about right is, is the mm -hmm. borderlands because that's something you focused on and in this context and again i mean i i know how these things sometimes go right you see sources that aren't really what you're looking for but sometimes they go into these areas could you comment on that at all about kind of afterwards if this regiment has any sort of role in that and in, in, in terms of this identity? Like if you came across any scrap of anything, that would be so insightful. I do it. I think there is a bit, as I said, I made this decision, they could be Canadian and continentals. So that was the first step is it didn't mean that they had to give up their identity right. as, okay, as right, right. law and the like be, to be a continental. And indeed when they were recruited, Hazen used French language recruiting posters and, oh. and enlistment for some of them. So we have that, that they could be incorporated that way. I will say over the course of the war that many of the French Canadians intermarried with the French Canadian followers. So we yeah. do see that part so that okay. they're still maintaining their cultural identity as French right. Canadian. Um, into it, but some of them marry American women. Right. So here we're starting to see this integration or development 
you know, one way or the other. I think that once they accept lands, to accept bounty mm-hmm. lands, the deal was, and, and you see this on other frontiers as well, is why not put veterans on the frontiers, give them lands on the frontiers. These are people who already know to fight. They know that they are getting this land because they fought for one side. Secondly, that they would be there to defend their lands and defend the nation to which they are then um, connected. And then by the time we get into the pensions, the national or federal pensions of 1820 and afterwards, there is this kind of declaration of I belong to America, this acceptance. I was in this regiment. I fought for America. Um, As a result, you know, America needed me and I gave my service. Now I need America to recognize my service. Right. And so by that point, really, as you're moving in into the 1820s, I think, and that by that time, you're talking about children and grandchildren, and they are, they've got their background as French Canadians, but they are becoming Americans. And certainly the Anglo Canadians right. just resumed their American identity in many ways, though Moses Hazen kept fighting it because it, he wanted his lands back. He wanted his property back until he died. But uh, sorry, yeah. I want to be how and what? <laughs> how do you think that was going to go? He kept fighting it, saying legally these were his, and so he was doing these court cases. The only trouble was he left and he was in debt. So part okay. of it, they were taking his lands. Not only was he a traitor, but he was in debt. You know, you were yeah. never going to get this stuff back. But he certainly tried. This was a man who was really land hungry. Apparently, all the time. So he he certainly was trying, and then he ended up basically impoverished. He couldn't hold on to his lands anyway. But Uh, sorry, that's just wild that he would expect to get that back. Yeah. Um, Wow. Okay. Is that? uh, I mean, again, because you've done lots of work on this individual, I got to ask: Is this guy? Is that hubris? Is this guy cocky? Where's that coming from? I think there is a lot of hubris. Um, I, I'm not a fan. You know how some people, they get in and they do biographies and they yep. fall in love with their subject. I yeah. never, ever fell in love with Moses Hayes. <laughs> you know, I just yep. looked at him and I said, this character, he's a pain in the neck. And he really <laughs> was. Um, and a lot of people looked at him and just said, he is so difficult to work with. He had expectations and he wanted his rewards. And I mean, from day one, he was fighting this. In fact, his lands, of course, he was losing the lands with the invasion heading towards Montreal and Quebec. And the invasion was right across his lands and there were fights and he was losing all of it. And from day one, when he finally joined the American side for sure, and he was creating his regiment, the first thing he did almost was petition Congress to pay him for everything he had lost (laughs) by supporting their cause. Right. Yeah. I lost the lands. I lost my cattle. I lost, you know, the peas in the field. I lost all of this stuff. You guys need to pay me back for all of my losses in this. And they paid him some, but he kept coming back over and over again, you know, saying I had lost too much in this. And I will say financially, he did not gain from this war. Right. Even though he tried to. <laughs> he really tried. Yeah. Because you hear always you usually hear about the success stories, right? Of that. Um, and no, nope, he was a there. land speculator from day one. And he okay. I think he went into this partly as a gambler. It's not just okay. that he mm-hmm. believes in the liberty and independence and yeah, he has yeah, some yeah. of that. But the other part is what he had seen after the Seven Years' War when he got lands up in Canada. He comes back. He is expecting more lands and more rewards. Um, Another thing he always fought about was rank. He thought he should have been made general, and he only was breveted a general. And he kept thinking, you know, no, no, I've been in here from beyond. (laughs) So he wanted rank. He wanted money. He wanted recognition, and he never got as much as he wanted. That's wild. This is, uh, yeah, he sounds like an interesting character, but not the best person. Um, but on the other hand, he was a great fighter. Or I don't know if he's a great fighter, but he knew how to keep fighting in battle. Right. right. So, yeah, he was a pain for everything else. I don't okay. think he was always the greatest as a manager. Yeah. But he was not afraid to fight. 
and there is something to be said for leaders. Yeah. Oh, who definitely. Are, he'll go into action, you know, and he'll be right there in the fight. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, there's a lot of those types for history. And I mean, a lot of people are watching, I know are, are really interested in World War II. So they know so many generals. So there's lots of those. Um, and I want to point out that he was somebody who kept pressing Washington and Congress to go and invade Canada again. Right. right. And again, and again, all the way up into 1782, after Yorktown, he's going, this is our moment. We need, <laughs> and I'm willing to lead an invasion force into Canada. <sighs> And Washington is going, now, hold on, <laughs> you know, how is this going to work? And we're waiting for the diplomats to do their bit. And, and Hazen was so afraid this war was going to end without taking Canada. And so he wouldn't get his lands back. Yeah, right. And of yeah, course, that, that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, sorry. Chris just literally said that because I, <laughs> I can get my land back. You got it. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like to me. It sounds like opportunism. Yeah. That's full regard. It's okay if we just ask a few more questions. Um, yeah, I know we're getting to the end here. One or yeah, two more. Get, sure. Yeah, I got a couple, two more. I think they're really interesting ones and ones I wanted to bring up and forgot. So yeah. I, I think I read somewhere that there were some Native Americans serving in the unit. Were, was there a significant number? Was it a handful? Or? No, not with the unit itself. Okay. Um, very difficult. I didn't see it. There were certainly Native Americans who did assist the Continental Army. Right. Um, often in their own independent units. We see this with the Oneida as, yep. as part of, of the Haudenosaunee, um, who, that split of the Haudenosaunee. Yep. And so there were some. Hazen did support the integration of more Native Americans. They were Abenakis in the Vermont, New Hampshire territory. Okay. And what we had there is that Hazen's regiment at one point here is as we're looking at 79 was blazing an invasion trail to go to Canada. This is what yeah. he wanted. This was in the midst or as a predecessor to Sullivan's campaign against um, the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee as yeah. we know. Yeah. And so as Hazen went up through that, he did support some of the Abenaki. He was giving some supply to them. Um, he was okay. supporting the idea of recruiting them in to the American forces, if not necessarily directly in the forces, at least as allied forces okay. or associated forces with it. But I did not see, you know, the Native American names as okay. enlistees in the regiment. As affiliates, yes, not as enlistee. And the other part is to note, by the way, especially for the French Canadians like the Gosselins who did finally get back to the regiment, they were going up and spying in Canada. And to get back up there, there is evidence that they dressed up as Native Americans. Oh, geez. <laughs> so that was one of the ways that they infiltrated into the area. That's one way to do it. Um, okay, one more question here. Um, this should be a quick one. Where is there any defections from the British services to serve in this unit or even at all that you've heard of? Other than no, as I said, service. the only biggie was Hazen, who had had a commission. He was on half pay, of okay. course, at this right. point. And so that was another thing he was complaining to Congress about is he lost his half pay. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going, well, yeah, you wouldn't expect them to keep paying you for being on the other side. <laughs> but um, no, so we don't see... Hazen would have been the only example of a half pay officer. And of course he was an American born officer in the right. British forces and yeah. joining that part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just, we got a question about this, but I'll try to wrap it up with us here. Um, the idea of, cause again, you looked at identity and, and I like that idea of a continental because I'm, I'm always thinking about this stuff in my own head, how this kind of works at the time period. Cause like I told you my family history there, the story there and how, how what would they consider themselves, you know? Um, about this and a couple of questions and some people have been bringing up, you know, these are basically mercenaries. Does that get the sense of what you got or is that kind of a modern thing we're applying backwards? I, yeah, I would not say it. I do say sometimes, you know, you think of it as a foreign legion, especially after 1781. Because right. okay. in 1781, Congress said that any foreign born recruits who don't have a state affiliation um, any others like that are to join Hazen's regiment. So after 1781, okay. the first Canadian is disbanded. By that right. point, it has so few people in it anyway. Yep. 
Um, and at that point, anybody else, so whether they're French, they're German, you know, Irish, whatever, yeah. if they're not coming from a state, they go right into Moses Hazen. So at that point, you start thinking, well, it's kind of like a foreign legion. Or the one that I associate it with is the Royal American in the Seven Years' War. Right. I think that there is, yeah. is a connection in the way it was organized or the way it was thought about is more royal. And it's I, I wouldn't call the Royal American a mercenary regiment. Right. So yeah. I'm not thinking of this is that they really did join. It wasn't just for money. Okay. The, the French Canadians and even the Anglo Canadians who joined, there was something in it that they thought, I'd rather support that side than the other because they gave up so much to join the American forces. So it couldn't be just for money at that point as a mercenary yeah, force. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think the, the idea of a foreign legion makes more sense taking our modern sensibilities because, yeah, it's the you know seen as you know mercenaries in some sense but it's 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 more than that and uh, i mean some some people yes that's always the answer there's always yeah. one or two or just i want the money that always happens in every army of ever and so again they're canadian continentals and i do like to use this as a stepping stone they don't immediately right. become americans right but what happens and we see this in congress's declarations new york declarations is serving is that step to being recognized as an american citizen and okay. that's still the case today. You know, yep. we can yep. have foreign war, yep. they're foreign, and they join American forces, and it's a fast track to American citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> so there is some sort of modern, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just all wrapping my head around all of this because this sounds so fascinating. I wish there was uh, more primary sources, but I wish that for everything. I guess that's never yeah. going to stop being yeah, a historian. Yeah. But yeah, just again, we can wrap up here, but I just think this is so interesting. Where Susan, one of our, our supporters here, is talking about because she loves doing battlefield tours. If, if This would make a good one because of all over the place. But even I'm thinking like that border region now today, I mean, obviously it's a little more difficult to cross the border between the two countries, but seeing all that area, I think that would be a, a fascinating uh, little area to take in. But uh, yeah, people are loving it. So thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I, it's always fun to talk about it. I'm so pleased you're all interested. Thank oh, yeah. you. Um, we've got a lot of Americans watching, a lot of uh, Brits um, yeah, a lot of that going on. And I got to ask, are you doing an audience just like the regiment? Okay. <laughs> exactly. That's what I tend to think of myself as. I'm bringing people from, from all over. Are you doing any more work on any of this stuff or is that kind of a finished well, Not as much with Congress's own. Um, the only thing is I'm still thinking, do I go back and finally after, <laughs> after what, 15 years, go back and edit and annotate um, the journal, the Sergeant Major's journal and get that out. Well, I know um, I know a certain group of people who would like that. <laughs> yeah, um, I did say to the Historical Society, because I've transcribed the entire journal, I said, if I don't actually set it up for publication, I'm going to send them the transcription. Okay. So it makes it a little bit easier to read for anybody. And that would be right. easier for them to copy and send to people. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I picked up on something I've done for most of my career is dealing with women during the war. Okay, cool is so my first book was dealing with camp followers though i was trying to remind people that men were camp followers too it wasn't just women oh, yeah. yep and um so i was i'm kind of coming back to that i i never thought i would do this but to pick up a little bit on margaret corbin she is the woman who fired a cannon at fort oh. washington in november yeah. of she's not molly pitcher but she's got an interesting story because she was wounded. And it brings us back to this point about the wounds of war for women as well as for men. Right. Yeah. And, okay. yeah. Yep. You know, so I'm not sure. I'm kind of contemplating going into that direction. Um, but as I said, so John H. Hawkins is still on the radar. And it looks like Margaret Corbin on the other side. And that's kind of where I am. Well, people want you to come back. So if you ever want to come back and talk about any of these subjects, um, you are more than welcome to, because I would love to again, dig into this and talk to you and our uh, our uh, group of people. Yeah, people are loving this. So it'd be great to have, uh, yeah, more. Sorry, I'm just reading the comments real quick. Um, yeah, I mean, these are also fascinating to us. We love getting into the nitty gritty. So you don't have to worry about being too niche here. That's one of the things we can get into with this, right? We can talk Thanks, about that stuff. Thank you. 
And now so, we've got more people knowing the Canadians served in the Continental Army. It's yeah. victory. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And it's not just a lot of people think about the Civil War. And it's not just the Civil War, it's even way back. So that's right. It's a fascinating one. But uh yeah, people again loving it. Got applause, outstanding presentation. So thanks again. Um, well, thank you very, yeah. very much. Um, Brad, I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you to everybody who listened in. Yes, thank you so much. So I have another live stream coming up this week on uh, Tuesday. We're going to be talking about uh, baseball, talking about American oh. stuff, <laughs> and um, uh, the chemical gas service uh, during the First World War. So that'll be interesting. So everyone keep an eye out on socials for that. Uh, looking forward to that one, getting into some more niche stuff, uh, some more American stuff. Uh, other than that, uh, everyone have a good rest of your Saturday weekend, and uh, I'll see everybody next time. Bye, everyone.